It's Professor Dave. Let's take a look at chromosomes. He knows a lot about the science stuff. Professor Dave explains. In biochemistry, we learned all about nucleic acids, including DNA. We learned about how nucleotides polymerize and how two strands of DNA come together to form a long double helix with millions of base pairs. But to go from this to a more complete understanding of all the chromosomes in every one of your cells is a pretty big leap. So let's fill in some of the gaps regarding chromosomal structure and arrangement. First, we must understand that while we often see pictures of DNA looking like this, DNA is not just floating around the nucleus in this form. DNA is typically coiled up to save space because there is so much of it to store. DNA strands are wrapped around proteins called histones, and these DNA histone complexes are called nucleosomes. Then this undergoes further supercoiling until we get chromosomes of the familiar shape. In a human diploid cell, which is every cell in your body except for reproductive cells, there are two versions of every chromosome, one maternal and one paternal, which makes two sets of 23 chromosomes, or 46 in total. Each chromosome will duplicate through DNA replication to give two identical sister chromatids. So here we can see a homologous pair of chromosomes which contain the same genes, but different alleles for that gene, one from each parent. So these are not precisely identical to one another. But each chromosome consists of two identical sister chromatids, which will be pulled apart during mitosis so that each daughter cell can have a complete set of chromosomes. When Mendel spoke of genes, it was an abstract concept, as no one knew about DNA at that time. But later in the century, when microscopes became powerful enough to see chromosomes and watch mitosis take place, scientists began to see that Mendel had been exactly right, and they developed the chromosome theory of inheritance they realized that the genes we learned about from Mendelian genetics are actually long stretches of DNA that code for various proteins. These genes have specific locations on specific chromosomes, and each chromosome in a homologous pair has the same gene at the same spot. This new understanding explained all of Mendel's observations. In meiosis, homologous pairs of chromosomes are separated, which accounts for the law of segregation. Only one allele for a particular gene will show up in a gamete, not both. And the fact that homologous pairs are arranged randomly during this process accounts for the law of independent assortment, because if two genes are located on two different chromosomes, the combination of alleles for those two genes that ends up in a particular gamete will be totally random as well. So before DNA structure was fully understood, we knew that chromosomes contained genes. As we now understand, each chromosome contains hundreds or even thousands of genes. Even still, genes only comprise around 1 to 1.5% 1 of the genome. So what's the rest? In between all the genes is non-coding DNA. This is the majority of the DNA, which does not code for any proteins. However, this area still serves a variety of functions, like transcribing RNAs other than mRNA, serving as origins of replication, regulating gene expression, and comprising centromeres, as well as telomeres. These sections, called telomeres, are found at the ends of each chromosome, and they are sections of DNA where, in humans, the sequence TTAGGG is repeated hundreds of times. This is because with every round of DNA replication, the enzymes involved can't quite copy the last couple bases. So this extra padding is present so that even after many rounds of replication, the ends haven't shortened so much 
that the genetic information present within an actual gene starts to get eroded away, which would be harmful to a cell. If this does happen, it is called replicative senescence. In some cells, an enzyme called telomerase regularly extends the telomeres, which buys a cell a little more time. Beyond telomeres, some areas of non-coding DNA are called transposons. These are sequences that can change position within a genome. Now that we understand how the genome is packaged, we should discuss a key difference in the chromosomes of human males and females. There is a pair of sex chromosomes present in each cell, and for a female, these are both X chromosomes with the familiar shape. But for a male, one of these is X and one of these is a Y chromosome, which is much smaller. During meiosis, all egg cells get X chromosomes, since that's all there is in the parent cells of a female. But sperm cells can end up with either an X or a Y, since they are both present in diploid cells for the male. A cell or zygote that inherits two X chromosomes upon fertilization will become a female, and one that gets an X and a Y will become male, so sex determination is essentially a flip of a coin. These two chromosomes are partially homologous, but obviously the Y chromosome is missing genes that are present on the X chromosome, as the Y is much smaller. This means that males have only one allele for certain genes, where females will have two. These are called X-linked genes because they are present only on the X chromosome and not the Y. In such a case, if the singular allele is recessive, a male will express the recessive phenotype, as there is no dominant allele present to override this. There are a number of disorders that are attributed to X-linked genes, such as colorblindness and hemophilia. We should also note that females with two X chromosomes typically have one of these largely inactivated in each cell, and the inactive one is chosen at random. So some cells have an active X chromosome that came from the mother and some from the father. This results in phenotypes like two colors of fur on female cats because some of the cells have an X chromosome active with an allele for one color of fur and other cells have the other X chromosome active which has the other allele and corresponds to a different color. So now we should finally be able to look at a picture of a chromosome and see all the tiers of structure within by connecting concepts from biology, biochemistry, and chemistry. This huge structure, a replicated chromosome consisting of two sister chromatids, is made of looped domains wrapped around a scaffold. These looped domains can be unwound to reveal a fiber of nucleosomes, which result when DNA wraps around histones to form tiny beads. And we can even zoom in on DNA to reveal a double helical form, the structure of the nitrogenous bases that dictate base pairing, all the way down to individual atoms and beyond. This huge structure contains genes that, when expressed, produce all of the proteins in your body. So how does gene expression work, and how is it regulated? Let's move forward and learn about this next. Thanks for watching, guys. Subscribe to my channel for more tutorials. Support me on Patreon so I can keep making content. And as always, feel free to email me, ProfessorDaveExplains at gmail.com.